Okay. Hello, this is your very quick introduction to occlusion culling. Uh, if you're in my class, you will need to do this as a part of an assignment. If you are not in my class and you found this on the internet, welcome. It's a little weird, but okay. Uh, this should be pretty helpful to you too. <clears throat> All right, so I have a little sample scene here with just a camera, a light, a couple of objects. We are going to set up occlusion culling. Uh, the first thing you always need is a camera, otherwise you can't occlude what somebody cannot see. And we'll have a number of objects. <clears throat> Excuse me. The occlusion culling window has a number of options in it. We'll have a bunch of scene filters here. I tend not to bother with these, but we'll go over them. The baking window is the one that's important. But if you just bring up the occlusion culling window and press bake, it's not going to do anything. Uh, it's going to fire this error here that says no render is marked as static. You can only occlude things that are marked as occludees. <clears throat> this keeps us from accidentally occluding things that are maybe huge and don't need to be occluded, or just prevent us from making mistakes for, say, the player model should probably never be occluded um, because the player can usually see themselves. But in any case, uh, let's talk about how to mark these things as static. I'm simply going to mark everything in my scene, uh, except for the player and the player camera here, which I'm going to remove, as occluders and occludees. An occluder is something that can block sight of another object. An occludee is something that can be blocked. Now, it's a complete waste of rendering and computer power to render things that the player can never see. That's the point of occlusion culling. We want to hide stuff. Uh, preferably anything that the player can't see at that current frame, that exact frame, uh, we should hide. Now our first occlusion culling isn't going to be great. These default parameters are fine. We can improve upon them though. So I'm just going to go ahead, since we've already marked our objects except for our player, as occluders and occludees, press this bake button. And by default, this is virtually instant. You can see that suddenly, if you, you may not have this checked, if you check on the view volumes, uh, you'll have these cubes everywhere. Um, so these are, are essentially our occlusion fields. These mark where objects can and cannot be seen from each other field. And when you enter a different field, uh, similar to the old viz leaves and things like source or back in the Quake engine, uh, this is the, the same idea. So if we go from edit down in the scene view to visualize, there will be a pretty drastic change already. We can only see in our game view the floor and this blue sphere. So everything else isn't being rendered. This is wonderful. This works great by default. Uh, and I'm usually pretty happy with the default parameters. We'll talk about this custom parameters in a moment. Uh, I will have to grab the player camera here so that we can look around. So as I turn, suddenly at the exact moment that I would be able to see the yellow capsule, pops in automatically. If I turn around, we have the same idea here. You'll notice I can't see the cube past this wall. If I turn in the other direction, I can now see the magenta cylinder. No longer see the sphere. See, it's a little generous with the shadows here. The shadow isn't quite visible on our game view. But there is a little bit of padding here, just in case. It does take a little bit of time to make these renders. Turn around again. And even if I'm facing all the way directly at this wall, I still can't see the cube that's behind it. Uh, let's see what happens if we improve some of these parameters. So your smallest occluder is the smallest object in any direction that can block visibility of another object. 
Uh, by default, this is set to five. That's five unity units or meters. Uh, that's usually okay, but if you have smaller objects or especially if you're working with something in VR, the player can lift up stuff and put it right in front of their face. So your occluder needs to be quite small. Um, for the sake of this example, I'm going to set the occluder all the way down to 0.1. So our smallest occluder is absolutely tiny. So if you remember what these uh, blue cubes here, these leaves here, if you want to call them that, um, are, uh, we're going to make them a lot smaller. So the smallest hole is the smallest thing that someone would be able to look through. That isn't relevant for this scene but I do tend to set them to both to 0.1. This back face threshold will be how many back faces are culled. Uh, back faces are generally things that are under or inside of other things and could never really be seen. The lower this number, the more aggressive the back face culling is. For the sake of example, I'm going to leave this at the most aggressive value, even though this scene won't really be able to take advantage of it. So if I click bake, even with settings that are uh, a magnitude different, you can see how small our cubes have become now. It's such a dramatic difference. We had maybe eight cubes before. We probably have thousands now. Um, so this, even with these settings, doesn't take a lot of time. But it's very important that before you ship any kind of project, that all of your scenes go through this process. Uh, this should never be neglected on any project, uh, unless you're doing something that's, say, non-Euclidean. That's the only example of where this may not be appropriate, but that's quite rare. Our occlusion data size that you see at the bottom right here is also tiny. This is a half a megabyte. Take the time, go through all of your levels, and do this just one by one. I Honestly, I wish there was a tool to do it all at once across all of your scenes. I think it would be really useful, uh, but we're not there yet. So this does need to be done individually, but that's okay. So let's see what happens now. We're facing the wall. We can't see any of the others. We still can't see our cube in the back. See, it's much more specific with these uh, portals and camera volumes here. So we turn, it's not even that much more accurate than it was before, but we account for smaller objects. So as we move through our wall, suddenly we can see our cube. And if I turn around, and slowly start to see everything again. You'll notice here that we can still see through this wall. There's an amount of, uh, shall we say, um, there's a little bit of wiggle room, let's say. So you could pretty easily get through here. You could look like this. And the entire time, there has been this completely occluded uh, cube at the bottom here, just to prove a point on this. So if we go down, we look here, suddenly they're gone again. So this system isn't perfect. But for one half a megabyte for this scene this small and 10 seconds worth of baking and customization in the occlusion culling window, you can get some pretty dramatic results. I find that with a large scale VR project, I'm usually getting about 30 more frames per second, which can bump me all the way up from 60 to 90 frames on a from a non culled project to uh, one utilizing occlusion coloring. So this can be substantial, as much as 50% better. Uh, so definitely do this in every project from now on. You probably should have been doing this already. Um, um, that's about all that I've got for you on occlusion culling. Oh, we'll talk about these scene filters. So these are things rendered. These are occlusion areas. We have not designated an occlusion area, though you can do this manually and make one of these and manipulate it as a new volume. Um, so this can exclude or include certain areas for occlusion. For the most part, I just use it everywhere. I, I don't see a lot of reason not to, but this at least lets us filter our scenes so that these are things that are marked as static or not. All right.
that's all I've got for you on inclusion calling. Hope this helped.